Welcome. So this last video goes over the dermis and some of the accessory structures within it. But just to backtrack a little, remember the epithelia is resting on its basement membrane and that basement membrane will be the connection to the underlying connective tissue of the dermis. So while the epidermis with its closely packed sheet of layered cells is providing that barrier function, the dermis in general consisting of fibrous connective tissue with that matrix of collagen and abundant elastin fibers are going to provide the strength and elasticity for the mechanical strength of the skin. And importantly, the connective tissue's gel-like ground substance serves as a substrate for the diffusion of nutrients and waste to and from the epidermis and accessory structures like hair follicles and glands. So these are brought in and out by the extensive blood supply of the dermis. So the dermis also has a host of resident immune cells that are there in the event of a breach in the epidermal layer. Blood vessels are also going to bring in immune cells if needed. Remember that connective tissue layer is the stage for the inflammation response. So unlike the epidermis, which replaces itself every month, the fibrous tissue of the dermis is relatively permanent throughout life. If there is damage to the dermis, it can be repaired, although not as cleanly as occurs in the epidermis. Mesenchymal stem cells there will become activated, produce more fibroblasts, which will affect the repair with newly formed collagen, but this often leads to scarring and deformities in the dermis. So the dermis is the main layer, and then there's two sublayers based on location and the type of connective tissue. The superficial 20% layer of the dermis is called a papillary layer, which is areolar tissue with its fine capillary network, which nurses and supports the epidermis. Filtrate, leaving these capillaries, diffuse through the substrate of the loose connective tissue to the overlying epidermis. So the surface area between the papillary layer and overlying epidermis is greatly increased by the projections called the dermal papilla. And that is it not only allows for more surface area for exchange of gases, nutrients, and waste products, but also strengthens the dermal epidermal junction by allowing for more connection area. So this dermal papilla itself is not visible externally, although there is big folds on the outside of your skin that we'll call friction ridges. Note that these don't necessarily correspond to the dermal papilla. These are much larger folds. So these friction ridges help you with gripping things and also make up your fingerprints. They also have a high concentration of sweat glands in your thick skin of your palms and your feet, which for unknown evolutionary reason respond more to mental and emotional stress than actual heat stress. But those are the visible friction ridges or fingerprints not to be confused with the underlying dermal papillary. So deep to the loose connective tissue of the papillary layer, it becomes gradually dense irregular connective tissue which is going to provide the strength, toughness, and elasticity of the skin with its abundance of collagen and elastic fibers. Because of the denser collagen bundles, the structures like hair glands and glandular tissue and larger blood vessels are in a more solid framework than the loose connective tissue above. So although this is dense irregular connective tissue, which provides multi-directional tensile strength, that is resistance against pull, there is some order to the orientation of these collagen fiber bundles. The majority of the bundles of fibers in a particular patch of skin are going to orient in a common direction that are reflected in the body's cleavage lines, or sometimes called tension lines. These lines reflect normal tension placed on a particular area of skin. And so these tension lines are well known and mapped out. Surgeons, whenever possible, will cut parallel to these tension lines to avoid scarring because the incision can be made along the length of the collagen bundles rather than cutting them in half perpendicular. So again, that's all due to the orientation of collagen fiber bundles in the dermis in a particular direction. So the larger blood vessels are located in the dermis and hypodermis and branch off superficially to the deep vascular plexus of the capillaries which feed the dermis as well as accessory structures embedded within them. The blood supply to the entire dermis is extensive and is used to regulate body temperature. In short, blood flow toward the surface can be controlled such that if you need to release body heat, you can increase the amount of blood flow and the heat will dissipate off your skin. Alternatively, you can shunt the blood away from the surface of your skin and retain that warm blood closer to your core and your vital organs.
So the dermis is that fibrous tissue providing strength and elasticity and again is a stable component unlike your epidermis. This is why tattoos are injected into the dermis where the ink will attract antibodies and will remain there for life fixed if it is done correctly. If the ink ends up in the epidermis it will only last about a month. On the other hand if it was injected too deep it would reach the layer under the dermis, the hypo dermis. This is the adipose tissue and the ink would spread around the fatty tissue and blur. So this brings us to the subcutaneous layer. Not officially part of the skin but where else are we going to talk about it? So this is the subcutaneous layer because it's below the cutaneous layer and it's also known as the superficial fascia because it is superficial to the deep fascia surrounding the muscles or it's called the hypodermis because it is directly under the dermis. It is composed mostly of adipose tissue and the thickness of it varies depending on the location in the body as well as your gender who store fat differently as well as genetics which predisposes people to store fat in different amounts and different locations. The adipose tissue being relatively loose allow the loose anchoring of the skin to the underlying fascia and other structures which allows a fair bit of movement in between the skin and the fascia. And the main function may be to act as an insulation layer preventing heat loss as well as storing energy in the form of lipids. So that's your epidermis, your dermis, and your hypodermis and a brief overview of their function. So your integumentary system also includes the accessory structures important for the functions related to the skin. These include epidermal derivatives such as hair, glands, and nails, and we'll also talk about sensory receptors here as well. As I mentioned before, the skin covering the surface of your body provides an interface with the immediate surroundings informing you of things that are against or near your skin. I'm just going to mention two of these receptors, although there are other receptors and nerve endings responsible for detecting temperature as well as pain and other types of touch. So keep these in mind when we discuss the somatic sensory division of the nervous system when we get to that subject. So for these two receptors, the receptor embedded close to the surface of the skin within the dermal papilla can detect faint pressures on the surface of your skin. These are called tactile corpuscles, otherwise known as Meissner's corpuscles. The other type of receptor is deeper within the epidermis called lamellated corpuscles or Pacinian corpuscles. These receptors require deeper, more sustained pressure on the surface of your skin for it to be stimulated. So there's hundreds of both of these and other types of receptors all over your skin and the higher density of receptors you have in a given area, the more sensitive you are to those particular types of touches. So those are sensory receptors and then there's three accessory structures we'll talk about that are all related to the epidermal layer of the skin developmentally. We talk about this during development of glands where epithelial cells grow inward into the dermis and form those exocrine or endocrine glands. These are how the sweat and sebaceous glands of the skin are going to develop but also how fair hair follicles developed. Nails too are just a modified version of your skin. So the first thing we'll talk about here covering most of your body in various forms are the hair follicles of which the shafts are the external visible part. That hair shaft itself is akin to the stratum corneum that is it is a layer or shaft in this case of keratinized cells, dead cells, although they're a little different keratin form. Hair in humans is a vestigial, useless structure, and the more highly evolved humans are therefore bald. Associated with the hair follicle are the erecti pili muscles, which is a strip of smooth muscle which reacts to fright or coldness by contracting and pulling the hair upright. Another structure associated with the hair follicle are sebaceous glands, which secrete an oily substance which moisturizes your skin. It also has antibacterial properties. So these are holocrine glands, that is the entire cell that's filled with lipids, lyses, that is breaks down, and the entire cell with its contents are secreted into the duct and out through the hair follicle to the surface of the skin. So this is why that substrate is so oily partially because of the cell membrane that's included. During puberty these glands are highly active and if the ducts become blocked this causes an inflammation response leading to things like pimples and blackheads. The other type of glands are sweat glands, and most of your sweat glands, the ones that occur all over your body, secrete a watery solution that's very important in thermal regulation, that is cooling the body as your sweat evaporates. 
Then there's another type of sweat gland localized to the smelly areas of your body, which are smelly because of the interaction between bacteria there and in the products of the so-called apercan sweat glands. Two things of interest to note is that the secretion from these sweat glands are heavily influenced by the hormones testosterone and estrogen. The secretions also may include pheromones, which you could look up if you're interested or ask me in class. The other interesting thing is that mammary glands, which will go on to produce milk in pregnant and nursing females, are modified apocrine sweat glands. So those are your sweat and sebaceous glands. And the last accessory structure here is also due to a modification of the epidermal layer. Here, instead of the most superficial layer of the epidermis becoming the stratum corneum, it's going to become a very hard, durable, keratinized layer that make up your nails. So that's it for the integumentary system, the structures of it, including the cutaneous membrane and the two main layers, as well as the sublayers, and then the accessory structures that are important in the function as well. All right, so at some point after adolescence, those sebaceous glands have calmed down. Your skin is going to reach its optimal appearance sometime in your 20s and 30s. After that, a lifetime of abuse from abrasion, chemicals, wind, and most damagingly, the sun start to show their harmful effects. The skin is the most visible reminder of the inevitable deterioration of your body and your mortality in general. So one big factor is the reduced activity of those basal stem cells, which result in a thinner epidermis, less likely to protect against mechanical trauma, and also repair and regeneration takes longer and longer as you get older. And this effect is magnified by the dermal blood vessels losing some permeability, and in general, the blood vessel distribution supply in the dermis is decreased. This doesn't help the hair follicles, which are producing thinner hairs or have stopped entirely producing hairs. There is reduced gland activity overall, resulting in a decreased ability to cool off with sweat and also cause drier and sometimes scaly skin because of decreased sebaceous gland activity. The other cell types in your skin also become less efficient. An increase in melanocytes and melanocyte activity causes altered skin pigmentation, which is why hair becomes gray or white, but also leads to greater sensitivity to sun exposure. The immune cells also show decreased efficiency and leave you more vulnerable to infection. There is also a drop in estrogen and testosterone, which affects your skin by affecting the distribution of fat and hair. For example, hair growth on top of your head decreases alongside increases of hair growth in your nose and your ears. And the last big thing is the underlying and collagen and elastic fibers begin to break down or become less elastic causing sagging and wrinkling. This kind of sagging is distinct from the creases developed over the years of making particular facial expressions like squinting or smiling, which causes things like laugh lines. So the intrinsic aging process happens to everyone to some extent, and you could sum up much of it based on slowdown of activity of those different types of cells providing these critical functions. And so there are obvious genetic differences that make people more or less susceptible to these effects than others, such as the type and amount of melanin and how naturally oily your skin is. So unlike bone and muscle, where you can proactively stem the tide a bit, with skin, you really want to pick the right parents. Beyond that, the best thing you can do is be mindful of overexposure to the sun. So the aging process is a little like that loss of function experiment we did with the hypothetical skinless people in the beginning of this. So in thinking about the integumentary system, you can think about the different functions that these layers, sublayers, cells, and structures provide for you.